Across over 100 years of automotive manufacturing, this little island in the North Atlantic has produced some properly belting performance cars. But which is best? Is it something classic like the Jaguar E-Type with its curvaceous silhouette? Or for the connoisseur, maybe the Lotus Elise for its overall poise? Or for the speed freak, the McLaren F1? Those are all brilliant choices, but as far as I'm concerned, none are a patch on a truly classless performance car. The cemented its name into history for being the original giant killer. Because today on Twin Cam, we're driving a Mark 1 Mini. And this isn't any old shopping car, this is the full fat homologation special Mini Cooper 1275S. It's now over 60 years since we were first introduced to the 997 Mini Cooper. And in that time, the Cooper name has become synonymous with the Mini brand, far surpassing even the car's original manufacturer. So to learn where all this comes from, we first need a bit of a history lesson. I'm sure by this point that everyone knows the story of the Mini. Suez Crisis, Bubble Cars, Leonard Lord, Alec Isagonis, Transverse Engine, Gearbox in Sump, Rubber Cone Suspension, 10 feet and a quarter of an inch. Back in 1959, motoring journalists didn't quite know what to make of BMC's new baby. To the British, it was very much a brand new concept and with the Mini's slender curb weight and astonishing handling, it didn't take long for the nation's motorsports types to turn and stare. Enter a man named John Cooper. You might have heard of him. At the time, his Formula One team was on top of the world and at his disposal were two pretty decent peddlers that you may also have heard of, Jack Brabham and Bruce McLaren. Cooper were world champions and their car for 1959, the T51, became the first mid-engine machine to win the championship and no front-engine car has won it since. It's safe to say that John Cooper knew how to build a racing car. And in an unbelievable stroke of luck, BMC's marketing department just so happened to lend Cooper one of the very first minis. And he loved it. In fact, he loved it so much that he took it down to Monza with him for the Italian Grand Prix that September, where many in the paddock gathered round to look. Cooper was fond of retelling a story from Monza, where Aurelio Lampredi, former engineer at Ferrari, borrowed the BMC press car and thrashed it about the Italian countryside for hours, remarking on his return that it was the car of the future. Quite predictably, Cooper went home and began plotting. Under the bonnet of a standard Mini was BMC's existing A-Series engine. At this point, not particularly iconic at 848cc and producing 34 brake horsepower. But give it time. Over the following decades, this little green lump would grow into one of the all-time great small engines. Cooper engineered a prototype hot mini and took it to see Alec Isagonis, the car's designer, and George Harriman, managing director at BMC. In his usual principled and straight-laced fashion, Isagonis fervently disagreed with Cooper's proposals. He thought the Mini should remain true to its roots and not be corrupted by this need for speed. Fortunately for history, Harriman loved it and he told Cooper they'd build a thousand of them. The arrangement meant that Cooper would earn a £2 royalty on every car, equivalent to about £40 today, and BMC would treat Cooper as the official works team in saloon car racing. But racing is important, as that nice round figure of a thousand wasn't arbitrary, because this was built to be a homologation special. The standard 850 Mini was already competing in various competitions, but due to its tiny power output, it wasn't exactly competitive. The platform was there, but the power hadn't yet arrived. So it was the little green lump under the bonnet that Cooper would be focusing his attention on. The original Mini Cooper was launched two years on from that weekend at Monza in September 1961 and it had, under its bonnet, a freshly engineered 997 CCA series with a very different character to the existing 850. 
It had a ridiculously long stroke, a tiny bore, a red-hot camshaft, larger valves, and twin inch and a quarter SU carburettors, making it completely different to any existing BMCA series, but meeting its targets of producing 55 brake horsepower and 85 miles per hour. Again, this doesn't sound like a lot, but that's a 61% increase in power. But the 997 Mini Cooper wasn't really what Cooper wanted. It was still underpowered, and in a need to make the engine cost effective, things like the cylinder head, for example, were existing BMC items. The new cylinder head, for example, was the same one that was about to be revealed atop the 1098 CCA series in the Austin and Morris 1100. But from this point onwards, various tuning houses got their mitts on the Mini Cooper and began working their own magic. Another name I'm sure more than a few of you will be familiar with is Daniel Richmond. And if you don't, you might have heard of his company, Downton Engineering. Downton's work was so well respected that BMC hired Richmond as a consultant, and he redesigned the A-series cylinder head with bigger valves and much freer flowing airways. And after various wranglings between Harriman, Cooper, Richmond and Stuart Turner, head of BMC's competitions department, the go-ahead was given for a slightly spicier Mini Cooper. Under the bonnet of that next hot Mini was an A-series at 1071cc, with that Downton cylinder head and a few other tricks to produce 70 brake horsepower. We're now 105% up on a standard Mini. And this little car was christened in April 1963 as the Mini Cooper S. That car, the Mini Cooper 1071S, was the car that really made the Mini the legend it is. Despite all of the Mini's previous successes, none could match the achievement of Paddy Hopkirk and Henry Lydon as they won the 1964 Monte Carlo Rally. This is where the Mini's giant killing really begins, and the tale of the little car that could began to permeate the British psyche. From 1964 onwards, the Mini became the car to be seen in, and though this isn't a video on the Mini story as a whole, it's the 1071 Cooper S that led the charge. But at 1071cc, it wasn't what everybody wanted when it came to class-specific racing. So BMC set back to work again and produced two new models that would fill different racing niches. By March 1964, they were ready. First was the Mini Cooper 970S. At under a litre in capacity and producing 65 brake horsepower, the 970 was a screamer. It had a big bore and a short stroke so they could stuff in the largest valves possible. With its tiny production run, the 970 is the standout Cooper, but of course, it wasn't the fastest. The most powerful was the car we have here today, the Mini Cooper 1275S. This was the peak of the Cooper with as much power as they could possibly muster from the A-Series, while keeping it somewhat drivable and somewhat reliable. At 1275cc, it set the standard as the largest displacement A-series BMC would produce. A far cry from the little 803cc it was originally designed for. In this tune, it makes 76 brake horsepower. A whole 123% up on a standard Mini. They achieved this by combining the large bore with a long stroke, making the 1275 much more torquey than a 970, which is better for rallying. And though this was nowhere near the pinnacle of A-series engineering, it would be the most powerful naturally aspirated engine that would ever be available from factory. But this is a Mini, and that means, of course, that it's not standard. This car does retain its original engine, but it's been bored out a little to 1293cc, then being fitted with an SW5 camshaft from Swifttune, who prepare all the minis that race at Goodwood. It then has a ported cylinder head, a lightened flywheel and a properly balanced bottom end. Then it has Downton H4 carburettors, and beneath it all, the factory optional gearbox, which is straight cut, like a proper racing car should be.
All this comes together to total 92 brake horsepower in a car that weighs 650 kilograms. This is a loud car. Now Mini's are loud anyway, but when you've got a Mark 1 Mini, no sound deadening whatsoever, you've got an engine like that, and you've got a straight cut gearbox, it's a bit ridiculous, but I love it. This car is genuinely quick, that little blast there. I'm getting up to quite silly speeds in a modern car. Never mind in a Mini. I love this little car. It's so overwhelming, orally, that you can't help but clear your head. This car makes you think about driving and nothing else. You can't possibly start to think rationally like a human being when you're in this car because you feel as though you're inside another being. This is a proper living, breathing car. Nothing, nothing at all else in the world can match the emotion felt in one of these little things. It feels like Tigger. It's laughing and bouncing around the place. And it's making me smile too. I've said since I was five or six years of age that I need a Mini in my life. But this car has made me realize that I need a Mini, like, now. Oh my God! What a fabulous little thing! It's so good! I love it! For a 
car to have this much ability in a package this small but this genius as well I cannot imagine just how much of a revolution these little things were in 1964 it's incredible oh and the thing about the straight cut gearbox is that it's not something that's been added this is aftermarket I keep forgetting there's no synchron first this is standard you could option a straight cut gearbox in a mini in 1965 I don't think there's a single car manufacturer in the world that offers a straight cut gearbox never mind one on a little economy car like this it's just joyous so good so good it's idling at a thousand rpm dead on as well If you see my video on the standard 850 Mini, then you'll remember that it has this huge, long, magic wand gear lever that goes right into the bulkhead. But for the Coopers, they decided that that wasn't good enough, so they needed a little bit of a performance upgrade. So this has what they call a remote change. So instead of going right into the bulkhead, it has a standard looking gear lever that goes into the floor. gear as well. I've never driven a Mini with the remote change before, but I'm a big fan of this. No secret mesh on first, which takes a little bit to get used to. Just need to remember that it's there, but apart from that, the gearbox, it kind of clicks really nicely to each gear. I'm a fan of it, very big fan. By our modern standards, the Coopers are very elegant little machines, with nothing big or flashy to set them apart. But these things began some of the mini traditions that are still apparent today. And the one we can see here is the colour scheme. This car's Old English white is offset by the black roof, and every Cooper had a contrasting roof. Black on this and tartan red, and white on every other colour. Then there are the grills. Austin and Morris Minis had different grills anyway, but they designed a further two to distinguish the Coopers. This being an Austin, it has an 11 slat grill that's flat, as opposed to the wavy one on the 850. And just above the grill, of course, is the badge. When the Cooper was launched in 61, the Mini name was still only in colloquial use and hadn't been applied to the cars themselves. They used the name Mini Cooper in brochures, sure, but on the cars themselves, they were the Austin Cooper and the Morris Cooper. On this car, its designation is given on a plaque above the traditional Austin wings. And to the rear, that same name is in the Austin script. But the interesting bit here is the S. Two years later, once they decided to up the ante, they seemingly couldn't be bothered to design a new badge, so a little chrome S was placed above the badge. And around at the back, this caused a bit of an issue. 
The space between Austin and Cooper was centralised, as you'd expect. But when it came time to add an S, they didn't do any moving. The S was simply plonked on the end, making a Mark I Austin Cooper S a little right side heavy when it comes to badging. And that's something you might not have noticed before. But something most of you'll have noticed are the twin fuel tanks. Contrary to popular belief, not all Cooper S's have twin tanks, but this one does, doubling the fuel capacity of a standard Mini for those long distance races and rallies. But there are some performance bits down at wheel level, because compared to a standard Mini, a Cooper S has a bit of added chunk to the track. These wheels are still 10 inch, but they're an inch wider than a standard Mini's, and beneath them are disc brakes, a world first on a car of this size. In order to make them fit beneath those tiny little 10 inch wheels, the discs are only seven and a half inches. launched in 1959, it came with rubber cones as its suspension medium. Now that's not the system it was ever actually designed to have. Well the system wasn't ready and so it only launched in 1962 on the Austin and Morris 1100. The Mini would take until 64 to get that system. And of course, that system is hydroelastic. This car, being from 1965, should have hydroelastic suspension. But instead, it's been fitted with the dry suspension, with the rubber cones. And a lot of people did this back in the day for the sake of track use, really, because hydroelastic is an improvement over the cones, but only in terms of comfort. For absolute stiffness and ability, it's better to have the cones. And so this car has had the cones shoved back in here. Think about a Mini sat here at idle. It's ridiculous. It's just everything is pulsating within it. Everything is vibrating. There's so much going on in here mechanically. If you're a car enthusiast and you don't want a Mini, there's something wrong with you. fast. And it's so sticky as well. It just clings. just the best. They are just the absolute best little cars ever. These things are cling film in automotive form. Now the dry suspension does give it extra stability, yes it stops all the roll, but it is incredibly firm. Now I don't actually think this car is too uncomfortable. I think it's fine considering what it is. So I don't think minis for their bouncy rocky ride deserve quite as much flack as they sometimes do get. It's not great obviously but it just feels so right for the car. It feels like it should be very very firm. It feels like it should kind of rock back and forth and bounce a little bit because it's a little tiny car making 
crumbly noises, yes, but also that really sweet little wine over the top. And it handles so well, it just feels right, the character, it feels right to be bobbing about the place. We're going really quite fast now, really quite fast. But there's a delicacy to the steering. At any speeds there's that delicacy, but these speeds even more. You can just suggest it into each lane. Absolutely brilliant little car. So good. I've already waxed on about the Mini's brilliantly focused interior in my video on the car as a whole. But the Cooper took it to another level, because the trim in here is something to behold, with red carpets, contrasting red and grey optional reclining bucket seats, and of course the now iconic triple central dials, complementing the standard speedometer with water temperature and oil pressure gauges, and taking us to 130 miles per hour, because Cooper S. At some point in its life, this car has also been fitted with a tachometer, as is fitting. And this one isn't any old aftermarket one, but a genuine 1970s Leyland special tuning rev counter, bringing just an ounce of motorsport into it. And that's what makes the Cooper special. Because Monte Carlo 64 wasn't the pinnacle of the Mini's efforts. Because Mini's finished on the podium every year between 1963 and 1968, winning in 64, 65 and 67. In 66 they won two, but were disqualified because of their headlamps of all things. Mini's won the Thousand Lakes Rally in 65, 66 and 67. In all, Mini's won 32 international rallies between 1960 and 1972. Then into the championships, Minis won the British Rally Championship in 62, 63 and 1970, as well as the Finnish Rally Championship and European Rally Championship in 65 and 66. Then over in Rallycross, they won the European Rallycross Championship in 1974 and 75. And off the rutted stages and onto the track, the Mini was just as impressive. These little cars in one form or another won the British Saloon Car Championship in 1961, 62, 69, 78 and 1979, by which point the Mini was 20 years old. It also won the European Touring Car Championship in 64 and 68, as well as the Australian Touring Car Championship, winning its class in 1962, 63, 64, 66, 67 and 68. At Bathurst in 1966, Minis finished 1st, 2nd, 3rd, 4th, 5th, 6th, 7th, 8th and 9th. The best of the rest was a huge V8 powered Chrysler Valiant, which despite being in the class above, finished 6 laps down on Rauno Altonen and Bob Holden's winning little tiny Mini Cooper S. For a generation, these cars were unbeatable, and the Mini was the original giant killer. And then there's a culture, because it wasn't just the victories that ingrained the Mini in our collective minds. Because of course, there was the Italian job, where the Cooper S became the ultimate urban getaway car. The Mini was a total game changer, and I mentioned before a man named Aurelio Lampredi. By the time he went on his little joyride in an early 850 Mini, he was chief engineer at Fiat. And in the years that followed, Fiat wholeheartedly embraced the Mini formula. First with Alta Bianchi's, then with the Fiat 128 and 127, which became some of Europe's most successful cars. In fact, Lampredi built on top of the Mini's philosophy by mounting the gearbox on the end of the engine rather than beneath, and giving his cars cheaper coil springs, which set the template for all modern cars. And then in 1974, Volkswagen copied that exact recipe and built the Golf. The Mini Cooper came along two years into Mini production, and two years into Golf production, along came the GTI. It would not be at all a stretch to say that the Mini Cooper is responsible for the Golf GTI's existence. And if it had a hatchback rather than a saloon, there would be no doubt that the Cooper would be the daddy of the hot hatch. And it is certainly the daddy of the pocket-sized performance car. 
This particular Cooper S is owned by my friend Alex, who has his own YouTube channel on which he nerds, drives and tinkers with this little thing. So I'll put a card in the corner and a link in the description if you're interested in hopping over. As I alluded to earlier, the S is a huge part of what made the Mini not just the success that it was, but the cultural icon that it became. This car is primarily responsible for the Mini's legacy today, the chic character and all the little individual touches that make a Mini nowadays such an enticing option. But we're in 1965. These Mark I Minis were made through to 67, but that's still a heck of a long way from today. So in a couple of weeks on Twin Cam, we're going to be looking into the 1970s and the Mark III Mini Cooper S. But until then, thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed the video, then please do click like and subscribe to Twin Cam as well. I'm forever indebted to my wonderful Patreon supporters, so if you'd like to support me that way, then please do follow the link in the description. And I'll have more videos coming along soon.